Well, I will start out by welcoming everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out or joining us in this vir virtual environment for the So You Want to Be a Radiation Therapist. Um, I'd like to start off uh, first with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm presenting to you today from Edmonton, Alberta, home of the University of Alberta. And the university acknowledges that today we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories and languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Uh, the Bachelor of Science in Radiation Therapy program is grateful to have the opportunity to uh, both learn and practice on Treaty 6 and traditional lands of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta as well. So I'll start off uh, our presentation tonight by uh, doing a little bit of introductions. First, I'll start with myself. My name is Leslie Wetzke. I am the uh, program administrator for the radiation therapy program. I've been with the program for uh, 10 years now. We're, we're just, uh, we've been around at the University of Alberta for 10 years. Um, so I'm not a radiation therapist, but I uh, do not want that to make you think that that lessens my enthusiasm for the career or for uh, for uh, the program. I feel pretty passionate about this. I have great co-workers that I work with, and uh, I'm happy to be presenting um, my part of the puzzle. Uh, now, uh, my part of the puzzle is more about the academics getting into the, the, the program, that kind of thing. But I have Dennis Weber, who's joined me tonight. And uh, Dennis is one of our clinical faculty members. He works and teaches over at the Cross Cancer Institute. He uh, has been a radiation therapist for many, many, many years and uh, recently joined our pro program. Well, it's not that recent anymore, is it, Dennis? We're looking at probably three years, four years that you've been with the program now? Yeah, it's been three years now, yeah. Three years now, yeah. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dennis. He has a wife, a son, a daughter, and a dog, or a dog or a dog coming, Dennis. You know, we've said that for the last three years, Leslie, and uh, I think this is the year that it's happening. No, no, this year. Good, good. If not, I might surprise him with one one day. Uh, Dennis enjoys hiking, fishing, gardening, uh, as well as coaching youth sports teams. Um, but the one thing that I definitely know about Dennis is that he's passionate about radiation therapy. He has practiced both locally and abroad for the last, um, for close to 30 years now. So he knows this stuff. So please welcome Dennis. And yeah, uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about the profession of radiation therapy. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, every single time we do this, I say we're going to try to make it quick because there's an Oilers game on tonight. And honestly, I don't know how it works out, but there's always an Oilers game when we do this. So uh, no, we're um, we're not going to do this quick. We're gonna we're gonna make this amazing. Um, radiate so radiation therapy is it's a small field. It's not really well known. And when when patients get a cancer diagnosis, there's sort of three to four main modalities of treatment. Um, we have surgery, chemotherapy, um, immunotherapy now, and radiation therapy. So um, the patients will get they'll, they'll basically meet a whole bunch of different doctors, professionals, and determine the best course of treatment for them. It could be a combination of, you know, surgery, chemo, radiation, immuno, whatever. Everybody is going to be slightly different, but radiation therapy is that piece that we play in that puzzle. And um, the way we work in a nutshell is we deliver um, therapeutic doses of radiation. So when we think of x-rays, that is, um, that's diagnosed diagnostic doses that's in the KV range and there's no serious damage that is done we operate in the MV range or the mega voltage and we the radiation that we deliver does enough um, has enough strength to basically damage the DNA normal cells can repair themselves but cancer cells as their mutant cells don't have that propensity for repair and then they just sort of die off that's why radiation therapy is is so effective for the treatment of, of many cancers. 
qualities of a radiation therapist. So um, since you're here today, I guess we know a little bit about you. We know that you're interested in um, in healthcare or at least exploring healthcare. And I, I truly hope that you you do a thorough search and and you look at all the different um, the different uh, areas of healthcare that you might be interested in. But um, the the thing I really like about radiation therapy is we we combine the patient care side as well as cutting edge te cutting edge technology. So um, we get sort of the best of both worlds. We we get to utilize all of the CT CT MRI all of that um, all of that technology, but yet we get to see our patients on a daily basis for up to six weeks. And um, we really get to know them and establish a rapport with them, help them help them with their the side effects that they may experience from um, from the treatments. And so, as you can see, there's some of the um, some of the qualities of a radiation therapist: compassionate, analytical, empathetic, a critical thinker, collaborative. We we work in groups. We work with other health professionals, um, effective communicators, um, committed to person centered care and lifelong learning. These are all really, really important traits for radiation therapy. This is just a, uh, this shows a couple of our former students who are now radiation therapists working in our vert simulator. So as you can see, they've got special glasses on and it um, really, it's just a way of treating patients without actually having the machine or, or at least learning about treating patients without having the machine. We, um, I think we have a video now that um, Leslie's going to show. This is from the Bird Simulator. So this is a pretty realistic depiction of what our machines, some of our machines, work look like. So this is a um, this is a linear accelerator. And um, you can see that we have a torso of the patient on there. We've got the crosshairs up top. Um, that's what we're going to use to light up to the patient every day. So that, uh, numbers, you can see a little, little cross on the side there. The lasers are going to turn on right away. Yeah. Make sure our patient is straight and level, delivering high doses. I think that's the end of what we're going to show with the video anyways. All right. Well, I'm not going to talk during this video. Um, okay. That's what what this say. is, is um, we'll have to do some testing sorry, with this one on so this. that everyone can see.
Okay, make sure that everybody can hear this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is um, two radiation okay. therapists, Hi. basically, and they are in. Okay. I'll try and I'll I'll turn the volume down as much as I possibly can. And we'll see how that goes. Oh, no, I'm not. I, I think they're talking, Leslie. I won't Hi. talk. Nice to meet you. Welcome. You ready to go for the next patient? Yeah. Maybe, maybe I will talk. <laughs> um, this was taken during COVID, but this is a pretty accurate representation of a treatment a, a patient would be getting for maybe a head and neck cancer or something like that. So as we had shown in the previous video, we're going to straighten and we're going to level the patient. Um, there's a bit of dialogue that goes on as we take the patient into the room. We're going to find out how they're doing, any side effects that they might be experiencing from the treatment. Again, patients just, we just ask them to hold nice and still during the treatment. So this patient has an immobilization shell um, for different areas like extremities, head and neck, uh, CNS, the brain, we'll, we'll use immobilization devices. So now the radiation therapists are just gonna rotate the machine around and do some checks before they treat. So every day we confirm what we're treating with x-rays or CT scans. So we are gonna compare the plan to the position that the patient is presently in. And if it's not exactly on, we are going to adjust. So every single day the patient is gonna be adjusted a few millimeters to ensure accuracy of treatment. All right, excellent. And oh, and one more thing, I just wanted to remind you that if you do need, we have a nutritionist that you can see. We have her on standby. We just have to send a referral over. And if you ever want to talk about ways to get better nutrition, you just let us know. All right? Great. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, sir. It was nice to meet you. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to clean up the room, okay? Trina, it was nice to meet you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. It's hey, actually quite a. Hi. We have a radiation therapy student joining okay. for this treatment. Hello. This is Trina. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Can you turn that off, Leslie? We're getting there. Excellent. Just back a slide. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was quite a realistic representation of what a treatment would be like um treatments last for about 15 minutes that would be the setup the actual or, or the imaging and the analysis of the image and then the actual treatment the beam on time is only going to be two to three minutes and then there's the patient care time after um well it's before and after and we're we're basically going to find out how they're doing Based on the site that they're being treated, there there's a number of side effects that can happen. So with a head and neck patient, we would expect them to um, have difficulty swallowing. Um, nutritional issues are definitely a problem. So they would see a nutritionist weekly. Um, yeah, um, definitely sore throat, um, possibly a cough. Yeah, stuff like that. So this shows us career opportunities with radiation therapy. Um, quite candidly, once you get a degree in, in healthcare, the world is your oyster. You can really do anything. Um, some of our present students are already talking about doing masters in um, public health or you know anything like that. Um, get a little bit of experience. We can, of course, the treatment um, treatment of patients, we've got a number of different areas you can work. So the symmetry does the planning of the treatments. The simulator area does 
basically the simulation or what the planners use to the, the CT scan, I guess, for the treatment. Uh, you could work on the treatment units and, and like I said, be in contact with the patients every day. That was my favorite part because, again, you get the technology and you get to talk and you get to meet these people every single day and you get to really feel like you're making a difference in their life, which is, which is excellent. Um, we have research opportunities as well. Um, if you're interested in research, it's, it's very well supported. Um, mentorship opportunities, um, education. Uh, what I'm doing right now actually yeah, is working with the university management as well. There's, um, it's not many management positions in radiation therapy, but again, once you have a degree in a health sciences field, there really, really are a lot of opportunities. We encourage you to stay in radiation therapy because we quite honestly need more radiation therapists. It's a, it's a growing field, which brings us to the next slide. I would say, how many years has um, Red Deer and Lethbridge been open, Leslie? Uh, Red Deer and Lethbridge have been open, I would say for at least 14, a little bit longer than the program's been around. They were both, uh, both centers were open. So I would okay. say probably for 10 to 15 years for sure. The newest okay. is the so, Grand Prairie, of course. Yeah, Grand Prairie is the new. So, so there's many opportunities, many centers that you can work on or, or work in within in the province, as well as the other provinces as well. Um, radiation therapists also can, well, your, your life, you'll, you'll be able to take the national exam so you can work anywhere in Canada. And you will also have the ability to work in UK or Australia, and you can take the exam to work in the US as well. So many, many opportunities. But to highlight Alberta, yeah, CCI in Edmonton and the Tom Baker, which the newly opened Arthur Child Comprehensive Care Center in Calgary, where I guess the original cancer centers in Alberta, and then the Central Alberta in Red Deer and the Jack Addy in Lethbridge opened up after, and the Grand Prairie Cancer Center, as uh, Le Leslie had said, is, is our newest center. And we will, uh, if you come into the program, we have three different clinical placements and um, there's th there's the, the likelihood that you might have to, you'll have to go to at least two of these centers, possibly even more, just depending on uh, your sort of trajectory in the clinical environment. So those are all of the different uh, 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 places where uh, you can practice across Alberta, but also where uh, you will also take your clinical placements uh, once you're in the program. So thank you so much, Dennis. You always do an amazing job of outlining what it is that a radiation therapist does. I think that's such an important thing when we talk to uh, prospective students, because it's not always um, fully understood what the career is all about. And uh, I think that it's important for students to really know that um, what they're going to be applying for, what the career would be like. And, and we always say that it's a really unique student that we're looking for because you've got um, you know your maths and your sciences and and as you can see uh, uh, by this slide uh, with the all the admission requirements you know it's pretty pretty heavy on the math and sciences uh, and physics and uh, but you also need to have that patient care side to who you are and uh, you need to be able to you know want to really be involved in 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 the care of these oncology patients as they go through their cancer experience so uh, it's kind of a unique student that we're looking for. And uh, I think that Dennis does a great job of highlighting that in explaining what the career is. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, now just about the process for getting into the program. I'm not sure who our audience is to, uh, tonight. So I will say that if you are still in high school, we are not a direct entry uh, into uh, the program from high school. You do have to come into any uh, post-secondary institution. And of course, we always say we would love for you to come to the University of Alberta to get your prerequisites. But um, you can obtain your prerequisites uh, anywhere across campus Alberta. Um, 
we just need to make sure that the courses that you take are transferable for all of these classes. So, and if you're already uh, a post-secondary student, you might have already taken a lot of these courses because there's so, there's some pretty general um, first year post-secondary courses that we ask for in you know the Chem 101, um, the English, math, those sorts of things are pretty pretty typical. Um, we do have a requirement that is not included in the pre-professionals. We don't actually look at your GPA in it. Um, and it is the uh, credit in NS201, which is the Indigenous Canada course. You can either do that here at the University of Alberta, or you can take the, the MOOC that's uh, done through Coursera. You just need to make sure that you uh, sign up for the certificate option, and then you will give us proof of completion of, um, of that uh, course. The reason why we have you do that is because all of our Indigenous learning within the program is built uh, off of the understanding that you've already taken this course so that we can move into, you have a good basis of an understanding of um, Indigenous um, uh, Canada situations, and then we can build on, uh, off of that with our curriculum, and you can better understand uh, sort of the Indigenous perspective in healthcare. So those are the um, U of A requirements. The non-U of A requirements are uh, the three credits of statistics, six of uh, cell biology, three of English, um, three of general uh, chemistry, three uh, credits of organic, and then calculus, and six of physics, and then three of either or uh, psychosocial. So again, if you are not from the University of Alberta and you are considering uh, applying to our program, I would really recommend that you reach out to the RADTH at UAlberta email and just um, ask the questions of, hey, will these courses transfer? And we're um, happy to have a look at them and make a determination of, uh, of the transferability of those courses. Um, one other thing about the, um, before we kind of get into the additional requirements, for those pre-professional grades, I also think it's really important for um, prospective students to know that we're all, always going to uh, look at the highest grade achieved in any um, course area. So for example, if you take a 100 level um, English and you don't do all that great at it. If you go up and do a 200 level, but you do you do much better, say you got a, uh, I don't know, a C in your first, and then you got a B plus in your uh, 200 level, we will always take the highest grade achieved in that um, course area. So uh, when you're filling out your, your um, application, you, you can always, you don't necessarily have to say these exact courses. If you went on to do a higher level chemistry or a higher level math and uh, got a better grade, as long as, it was, as it's a calculus-based math, um, you can use that course as your pre-professional because we always want to give you the best, um, you know, the best situation so that you're highlighting uh, your best performance. Okay. So beyond those pre-professionals, uh, so you, you've come to a post-secondary institute, you're starting to do your, your prerequisites, you're actually uh, registered in all of the prerequisites, you now just have to, to complete them. So you're in uh, completion what needs to be in the winter term before the fall intake. Um, at that point, you're ready to apply to the program. So you're gonna do your application. You're gonna fill out those pre-professional courses. And if you're still working on them, you're gonna put IP in progress for the ones that are still uh, incomplete. And uh, then the next step in the, in the admission process is for you to write a career reflection letter. And we have uh, criteria on our website that highlights uh, what we're looking for in those career reflection letters. But mostly it is about how you feel that you would be a good fit for the profession of radiation therapy. 
Um, it isn't, you don't have to uh, demonstrate any kind of knowledge of the healthcare system or of, um, of radiation therapy specifically. It's more about uh, yourself and how you feel that you will benefit um, the, the career. And then um, once those career reflection letters are, are gathered, we do, they're, they're put through a review process. And then we take a look at everyone's, all of the applicants, um, their pre-professional pre GPAs, their um, overall GPA of the last two years of full-time study and the results of the review of their career reflection. And those are, ranked we you know, everything has um, rubrics tied to them and and then a ranking happens and from the ranking we make a determination of how many um, applicants we are then going to go on to uh, invite to the MMIs which are multiple mini interviews um, and those take place in early May and um, as it's highlighted on the screen here they're just a series of short carefully timed interviews and they're not, they're all scenario based. There's no right or wrong um, answers to MMIs. And if you, uh, I highly, highly recommend to any students that are considering entering into our program or really any healthcare program, because most of them do have some sort of interview process. Um, do your research about MMIs, learn what those are, do some practicing. There are, even the University of Alberta actually offers uh, sessions for practicing um, prep for MMIs. Uh, it's a good idea because it gives you, again, another advantage when you are entering into those very stressful interviews, which um, Dennis is often one of our interviewers. So uh, as you can tell, he does not stress people out. He's very kind and gentle, and <laughs> but it is it is a stressful situation. So you want to be as prepared for it as you can be. All right. So then, if you're ready to apply, you're just going to hit that. Uh, go to the uab.ca/apply, uh, and uh, it's a little bit tricky to actually find our our uh, programs because a lot of students. Uh, prospective students go in, they think that they're just looking for an undergrad program, but actually our program sits under the professional programs. So you actually have to select rather than, I think it's undergrad, you have to actually select professional programs, and then you're going to go into the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, and we'll be listed in amongst the five programs that the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry offers up. And you can always reach out to contact us um, uh, through the uh, through our uh, email account at radith.ualberta.ca. Um, and there's tons and tons and tons and tons of information on our website. Um, not always easy to navigate. I'm sure that uh, um, you people are very aware of what it's like to navigate the U university's very large website. So if you are having a hard time finding information, I would really recommend reaching out to the email address there and we'll kind of guide you, send you some links of where you can go for information or even just talk it out with you. And I think, Dennis, I think that's it. So Danielle, um, should we open up for uh, questions? Yeah, so um, if there are any questions, there is the Q&A function um, on your screens. Everybody should be able to see that at the bottom. It's right next to the chat function. If you wanted to add in any questions you have in there, um, I'm sure Dennis and Leslie will be more than happy to answer those. Um, this is a great time to ask any specific questions because um, it's not a large group of students. So there is time for you to get a pretty in-depth answer. Um, if there are no questions right away, then definitely reach out to that email. But so far, there's none. So maybe we'll give it a, about five minutes and see if anybody pops up anything in their heads. Sounds good. 
I did also want to let everyone know that um, we are uh, going to be hosting an open house at our training suite over at the Cross uh, Cancer Institute at towards the end of February. Um, I am going to be sending out an invite for that. Um, so I will, um, uh, sorry, I'd sign up a registration form for that. So if you are interested in, um, in finding out about that event, please send an email to the rat at ualberta.ca and then I'll be able to include you in the mail out for that open house event. And that is, um, uh, over at our training suite again, and it, we will um, actually do a demo of of a of a treatment there. So I see some questions coming in. They're all you, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, may I know how many students will be accepted each year? Sure. Um, so we currently have a cap of fifteen students. Um, we have a, there's a real um, push from our clinical partners for us to increase the amount of students that we take in. There's a need for radiation therapy. So I'll, I'll answer Callie's question as well about the outlook for radiation therapy. There's a very big need in this province, in this country, <laughs> in their neighboring country. <laughs> Probably, Dennis, is it fair to say internationally that there's a shortage of uh, radiation? I hate saying the word shortage, but there's a need. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We. Um, I've been just this week. I was. Um, I had someone from New Brunswick reaching out, wanting to get in front of our students, and uh, so we we kind of have from all over Canada. And then how many people apply every year? There's, so we currently have um, about 80 applicants that are, and our, our deadline to apply is um, March 15th. The thing about the 80 applicants is that um, of those 80 applicants, there's a lot that don't have all of their prerequisites. So it usually gets called down. I think last year we brought in 23 applicants to interview in our MMIs, if I remember correctly. Uh, okay. Am I missing some, Danielle? How am I doing? <laughs> You're doing great. Um, another question, is there any particular, like a big one, is there any particular like undergrad program or pathways you recommend for high school students um, to take to get into this program? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so there, uh, obviously at the University of Alberta, you can enter into either uh, the Faculty of Arts or the Faculty of Science, and you would um, be able to access all of the um, prerequisite courses that are there. So it is kind of how I usually advise students is that we always want you to be working towards a goal when you come to university. So um, even if your main goal is to come into the radiation therapy program, when you're starting out just doing those prerequisites, sort of always have your plan B in your mind. If I don't get into, because we are a competitive program, if I don't get into radiation therapy this time around, how, what else do I want to be working towards? And then I would say, if you don't get in on your first round of applications and you still feel very passionate about this career and you want to give it a try, apply again. We've had students that have um, gone through a couple of rounds of, of, um, of applications and uh, before they get in. So I would really suggest that, that you could do that. Um, salary I'm, I'm happy to take the salary range sure yeah. that'd be great so I just googled it under AHS and AHS is saying it's 43 to 62 dollars an hour is the salary range for a radiation therapist so as you get more experience yeah. um you obviously would go up in salary um different positions would pay differently as well the really great thing about radiation therapy is you are working Monday to Friday 
and the the lifestyle is really excellent. You're maybe on call twice a year. That is it. So your weekends are always free, and um, yeah, the the days are you know earliest is six thirty. The latest is right now about five thirty that you would be working. But the standard shift would be you know nine till five thirty or eight till four thirty, something like that. So I hope I answered that one. Great uh, uh, life work balance for in comparison to a lot of other uh, healthcare professions because you are in clinics and they do run, as uh, Dennis said, mostly mainly Monday to Friday. Of course, there is a little bit where it's needed, but those are are not the norm. Um, so it is it is really good that way. We always I. I like to say that compared to say nursing, um, there's uh, a lot less body fluids and no shift work. <laughs> That's my my selling point. <laughs> uh, um, is qualities that stand out for yeah. me, Leslie. I'm I'm happy. I mean, we can both take Absolutely. this question, but um. I, I'm stealing this from the All Blacks, but good people make good radiation therapists. Honestly, if you're you're kind, you're empathetic, you're caring, you care about people. Um, it's genuineness like that just really, really stands out, and uh, uh, those those type of people do very, very well. A lot of our do job is small talk and getting to know people so that they're going to open up to us and tell us about their life and the problems or the the challenges that they're having with treatments. And, and then the reward is of course, being able to, to help them navigate that. So uh, those qualities stand out for me, Leslie, I'm, I'm, you, I'm sure that, you have qualities that you look for as well. That's excellent, Dennis. Yeah. I think that that's, that's one of the, when I think about sort of our, our student body over the last 10 years that the program's been in existence, um, it, probably the the compassion and the ability to want to problem solve and um, and connect with patients and make a difference in their lives are probably the qualities that stand out the most. And it's it's so interesting because and that is partially why we do the MMI process because um, your grades are always going to be really important. The program once you're in it is is academic. So we need you to have good, strong academics, of course, but we also need you to, to have that caring, compassion side. And that doesn't always translate. Good grades doesn't always translate into that type of individual that Dennis just described. So we hope to um, find that in you through the MMI process. Yeah, and someone's saying about kinesiology being a good uh, program to do before entering the program. And I would say absolutely, because it is, you know, it's related to sort of bodies and what bodies do. And <laughs> it probably would give you a good um, basis for uh, coming into the program for sure. Dennis, do, would you agree? I, I think so. I mean, as long as it, as long as you're meeting all your prerequisite needs. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that would be the one thing that I would say about kinesiology is the kinesiology program at the U of A is very kinesiology movement focused. So you might not get those general chemistry first year classes, yeah. things like that. So you might have to plan your elective options to be more science focused. Um, so that is something to think about as well could be a challenge to do, yeah, to do both. I see what you're saying, Danielle, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of our, we have a very, the the programs that people have entered into the, um, like previously, they, well, we, we have a, a real wide variety of students that have come to us. So we have some that already have masters and then they find out about the program and, and realize, Oh, I want to be patient forward. So I, I you know, I don't want to be a researcher. I actually want to be patient forward. So a lot of uh, 
there's such a huge variety of of students that come from us from a variety of backgrounds. Um, we have uh, students who have done journalism in the past and then come and find the radiation therapy program. Um, yeah, uh, obviously the, you know, cell biology, um, the maths and sciences are kind of obvious programs that you would, uh, you would enter into, but uh, it, it is, there's a big variety of backgrounds that people come from. Yeah. Any more questions out there? Like I said, we're happy to also answer uh, through email. There is a, on our uh, landing page for the program, there's also an ad admissions advising form that you could fill out. And on there, uh, you have the option of, of talking to um, an advisor or to one of our, uh, our instructors who are radiation therapists um, or one of our current students. We can also arrange to have you uh, talk with one of our current students as well. So you can get, the, get an idea of what the um, student experience is like within the, a small program like ours. Ah, great question. Yes, we have simulation. Um, so that's, Dennis, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the training suite and ClinSim? Sure, absolutely. Um, we have, we are so fortunate. We have what's called a light Linux. So it really is like the machines that um, treatments are done on but it, it doesn't actually deliver therapeutic radiation. We can still take x-rays with it, but um, we have one of those at the Cross Cancer Institute and the students spend quite a bit of time there, um, I guess, learning learning about the machine and the equipment. And um, yeah, I, I guess the simulated uh, sort of learning environment is, is right at the Cross Cancer Institute. So a five minute walk from, I guess, the university campus, but uh, yeah. We have a, our, uh, the clinical uh, simulation course runs in the spring summer session uh, of year three in the program. And it you're actually in a 13 week simulation where you will be treating um, standardized patients, which are uh, patient actors. And we also have, we have the good fortune of having volunteer patients as well, who are former um, cancer patients that come and volunteer with the program so that you can actually learn from um, cancer survivors about their experience in clinic and um, our standardized patients, the actors are great, but I think our volunteer patients are amazing because they can really um, tell you, they're they're not afraid to let you know when you've perhaps <laughs> stepped on somebody's toes, yeah. It's as realistic as it could possibly get, yeah, they are absolutely amazing. That lived experience. Awesome. I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I think we can close this down a little bit earlier than six o'clock if you want, Leslie. Absolutely. Sounds great. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Danielle, as well, for your help. Yeah. Thank you so much.